This is going to be a, a red lecture. Um, it's new and um, uh, I hope that I can describe it at least as half-baked, um, but it might turn out only to be a quarter, but anyway, you will be the judge of that. I've never, I've written incidentally about matters Japanese in the past, but um, uh, um, I've had my bluff called by Joost Bakker um, about talking about Japan, so here I am. <clears throat> in the preparation of this lecture, I owe thanks to a number of individuals without whose help it would not have been possible to bring it to even its present tentative state. Uh, they are the people, well, first of all, my wife, Elizabeth Baird, and Joost Bakker, they're at the front of the list because of the alphabet, uh, my photographers. Um, Eric Kasdan, who teaches at the University of Toronto, Mamoyo Kajima, uh, Gary Kamamoto, Fumiko Maki, all in Tokyo, Marley Ross, who arranged for us to have this amazing Japanese excursion or, um, earlier this year. Andre Sorensen, a geographer a friend from the University of Toronto. Uh, Yoshiharu Tsukamoto of Bow Wow in Tokyo. And last but not least, George Wagner, who got me to Japan even before Joost Bakker did. Um, I want to thank the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at UBC and in particular, Matthew Sewells and Case Lockman for inviting me to present my thoughts to, to, to you here tonight. And I'd like to say I'm, uh, Matthew's not here. Matthew is a former student of mine from the Graduate School of Design, who's now um, a young faculty member at UBC. And I'm sorry he's not here, but as many of you are probably aware, um, he's uh, had some serious recent health challenges. Uh, which he blessedly appears to be uh, overcoming, um, but he has not overcome them sufficiently yet to be able to be here tonight. So, but I certainly salute his uh, role in um, helping to make tonight possible. Finally, I also would like to thank Dialogue Design for their generous financial support of the event. Okay. I have been curious about Japan since my days as a student in architecture over half a century ago. Early on in that education, I developed a preoccupation with the Katsura Imperial Villa, which you see here, and that preoccupation was reinforced uh, by a gift to me from my wife of a copy of Kenzo Tange's and uh, Yoshiharu Ishimoto's famous book about the Katsura Villa that was published in 1960 with its introduction by Walter Gropius. Only recently in the preparation of this presentation have I realized the full importance of that publication. Eric Kasdan, a U of T colleague in comparative literature, one of whose specializations is Japanese film, told me that in order to understand Japanese architecture in historical context, it was imperative that I read Arata Isozaki's book, Japanness in Architecture. I have now done so, and as a result, come to realize the extent to which I was back in those days, back in my student days, I mean, a victim of an ideological campaign in architectural history orchestrated by Kenzo Tange. The campaign in question is a subject to which I shall return later in this presentation, but be all that as it may, for personal reasons I can't even explain, that early curiosity of mine about Japan didn't result in any travel there for a long period of time. Interestingly enough, Isozaki was the first prominent architect from Japan that I ever met. That was in the 1970s when he participated in one of a series of lecture tours to architecture schools in North America, organized by Peter Eisenman's Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York. I had signed Toronto up for the Isozaki tour, and here in due course he arrived and made a presentation. I have to confess, I don't recall his lecture very well, uh, 
but I do remember him including in it an image of one of his own very few projects that could be called Metabolist. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, this is it. Um, <clears throat> first on its own, and, and then again in a now famous collage, this is it, uh, which um, rather provocatively super uh, just juxtaposes the, the Metabolist project and some classical Greek ruins. So I was aware early on of, his, of Isozaki's disillusionment with the ambitions of his Japanese contemporaries in the then so prominent metabolist movement, another subject to which I'll return later in this presentation. After that, my next encounters with notable Japanese figures were at Harvard while I was teaching there in the 1990s and early 2000s. Toyo Ito came to deliver a guest lecture, and Kazuyo Sejima came to teach a studio. However, Ito was there only briefly, and while Sejima stayed longer, her English was weak in those days, making it difficult to converse easily with her. But it was a different matter altogether with Momoyo Kajima and Yoshiharu Tsukamoto of Atelier Bow Wow, both of whom had studied abroad, uh, her at the Etaha in Zurich and he at Paris Belleville. They came to the GSD as visiting faculty twice during the period of my own teaching there. We attended each other's reviews and they presented me with some of their publications of that period, such as Made in Tokyo, and pet architecture. This is made in Tokyo, and this is pet architecture. These introduced me to the fascinating subject of the urban form of that, ma of that major world metropolis, i.e. Tokyo. Interestingly enough, I, in the reading I've been doing, um, Tokyo still manages to be, even though it's in a race with cities in Southeast Asia and Africa. It still manages to be the biggest city in the world. And in my recent reading, I've discovered that it first became the biggest city in the world in the middle of the 18th century. A kind of remarkable <laughs> historical fact. Um, so anyway, I was, I, I was very engaged by the work of Kajima and Tsukamoto. Uh, as part of my teaching at the University of Toronto, I had already undertaken research on the urban form of my home city of Toronto. Uh, this is the publication from 1978. Um, and while on the faculty at Harvard, I would undertake some parallel work on Las Vegas, uh, which you can see here as republished in the the collection of my writings that um, George Wagner was referring to in his introduction. Hence, I was especially interested by Bow Wow's urban research on Tokyo. <coughs> Accordingly then, when my friend from both Harvard and UBC, George Wagner, offered in 2010 to serve as a part-time guide to Tokyo while he was conducting a study abroad studio there, I leapt at the chance to see Japan for, firsthand for myself for the first time. Now it is time for me to say how surprisingly different from my expectations Tokyo turned out to be. During the 1990s and early 2000s, many of you will be aware of this already, a group of architects that I call the dystopic avant-garde were very influential in architectural educational circles, largely comprising second-tier followers of Ram Koolhaas. They tended to make grand theoretical pronouncements um, wax and in which they waxed both ecstatically and gloomily about the astonishing phenomenon of hyper-dense cities such as uh, Dubai, yikes, Hong Kong. Hong Kong, by the way, is the only city on this list that really is hyper-dense. Um, the rest are just pretend. And this, of course, you know, one of the most notable icons of this ideological fetishism is the famous um, Kowloon Walled City, which has since been demolished. Doubt definitely qualifies as hyper-dense. <coughs> Um, oh, and then, of course, finally, 
uh, Pudong in Shanghai. And of course, frequently, Tokyo was also cited by this crowd. We were warned that we might hate such places, but in doing so, we were subtly advised we would be simply exposing our professional incapacity to deal with the inevitable contemporary urban reality they represented. So as our aircraft from Toronto slowly descended into Narita, I braced myself for the Japanese version of this new world urban reality. So that's my introduction. Now we come to part one of my talk, understanding the urban form of Tokyo. Sure enough, as our airport shuttle bus approached downtown Tokyo, a sort of hyper-dense urban form did indeed seem to present itself to us. Um, in the late afternoon twilight, the complex elevated expressway interchange in Nihonbashi, just over the Sumida River, brought our bus close to the middle stories of office buildings as it gradually wound downwards into Marinucci and eventually to a hotel where Wagner had advised us to disembark and to take a taxi to the apartment building he had arranged for us to stay at. And thus it was that we arrived later that evening in Kagurazaka. This is Kagurazaka, a Tokyo residential neighborhood that is both very typical of Tokyo and at the same time surprisingly distinctive. What was distinctive about it was that it was the French Quarter of Tokyo. I hadn't even known there was such a thing. And what was typical was its, its, <coughs> excuse me, its extraordinarily intimate neighborliness. As we spent our subsequent days in Tokyo, wandering through many different parts of the city, I found myself both fascinated and infuriated. Fascinated on account of the many intriguing and often engaging discoveries we made in so many different parts of the city, and infuriated to have been misled in advance about what to expect by the fanatical protagonists of the dystopic avant-garde I mentioned above. For the simple truth is that Tokyo is not hyper-dense. Um, in fact, I expect the detailed analysis would show that a major percentage of the buildings in Tokyo are not more than three stories in height. Try that. <coughs> um, indeed, in their 2006 publication, Project Japan, Ram Koolhaas and Hans Obrist cite the statistic that circa 1960, the average height of buildings in Tokyo was one and a quarter stories. As many of you who have been to Tokyo will be aware, the city includes a number of major transportation interchanges, and at each of them, a major urban node has developed, which typically includes a number of tall commercial buildings and hotels. But even the tall buildings at the nodes do not exceed uh, 40 stories on account of regulations having to do with flight paths to Haneda Airport, the downtown Tokyo airport that is still very active. Shibuya, Shinjuku, and Roppongi are, <clears throat> are typical examples of such nodes, and it is they that conjure up plausible images of possible hyperdensity on account of a number of factors. First of all, these nodes tend to be located in topographical valleys associated with the roots of pre-modern rivers. Oh, sorry, no, actually, sorry, I should have, you should, I should have, that's, that image is supposed to, I'm supposed to have already shown you as a kind of example of the, the, the characteristically low urban fabric of Tokyo. Not everywhere, of course, but predominantly. So now, <coughs> here we are in Shibuya. Uh, uh, these, these nodes tend to be located in topographical uh, valleys associated with the roots of pre-modern rivers. Second, each of them accommodates the intersections of numerous different transit and road systems. Um, here's another example, one of Joost Bakker's photographs. Uh, and, on, and, and on account of topographic variability, these intersections typically result in the creation of dramatic, complex, three-dimensional infrastructure apparatuses. Um, here is one in Shinjuku. 
finally, being such intense urban locations as they are, these nodes therefore also attract major office, hotel, and retail functions, um, <clears throat> uh, thereby producing the, relative, the relatively tall building forms already mentioned. Here you're looking, o looking over the characteristic urban fabric of Tokyo in the direction of the urban node at Shinjuku. Still, all that having been conceded in between the nodes in question and throughout the urban territory of metropolitan Tokyo, innumerable extensive low-scaled residential neighborhoods continue to exist, only separated off from one another by recently created wider urban arterials. You can see some, one of a few of those, uh, you know, the, the buildings which align, al aligned, are aligned along one of those in this view. Um, uh, wider urban arterials that are lined by mid-rise buildings um, and in fact here is a, a drawing by Tsukamoto uh, that captures this urban reality. These, these um, it's a combination of road widening for traffic purposes combined with an effort to make fire, uh, uh, fire blocks uh, on account of the kind of still ex surprisingly high proportion of Japanese low-rise residential construction, which is still uh, uh, timber and susceptible, well, in fact, in part two of this talk, we'll talk a lot about the, the tendency of J J Japanese buildings to burn down. It's kind of long historical reality. While it is clearly not hyper-dense, it is true that Tokyo does have an unusually high average level of density, and it isn't difficult to identify the defining features of that density. First of all, living space per person in typical Tokyo residential accommodation is much lower than it is in most Western cities. Second, even though buildings are built as freestanding entities on small individual parcels of land, there are no party walls in between res residential buildings in Tokyo residential neighborhoods on account of the risks of earthquakes and fires. The lot coverage is very high and private outdoor space at grade is minimal. Finally, <coughs> excuse me, finally, the ratio of urban automobile ownership is much lower than in the typical western city and the local street network much tighter in dimensions. Examples of all of these characteristics are evident in the following photographs taken by Elizabeth Baird in mostly in Kagurazaka. How's that for small scale street space? Here's a typical res res residential parking space on site. Um, and then some further streetscape scenes. As our time in Tokyo proceeded, I became ever more fascinated by two urban phenomena which I found unusual, but which are both quite typical of Tokyo. First is the astonishingly extensive pattern of highly differentiated ownership of urban land. Except at the nodes described earlier, <clears throat> typical parcels of land in Tokyo are astonishingly small. A number of Bow Wow's examples of so-called pet architecture sit on them. Here you, you, some of you I'm sure are familiar with these. There's, there's the thing in reality. There's Bow Wow's conceptual graphic representing it. Here's another one. And here's the, the graphic representing it. Then there is the related phenomenon of the so-called pencil building. <clears throat> uh, a relatively tall and small footprint building constructed on a small parcel of land. Not as small as the sites that accommodate the examples of pet architecture, but small enough. Here is an example photographed by my wife from our Kagurazaka apartment building. And here is an even more astonishing one we found in Ginza. Um, you can see the building in the kind of middle of this view. Um, 
Buildings of these unusual proportions simply do not exist in Western cities. Since that first trip to Japan, I have continued to be curious about the, the twin phenomena of the vast extent of a highly differentiated pattern of land ownership and the related phenomenon of the pencil building. It is Yoshiharu Tsukamoto of Bow Wow who has pointed out that there are some 1.8 million individual parcels of urban land in Tokyo, and that these parcels are owned by some 1.7 million individuals together with roughly 100,000 corporate groups. Elsewhere, I have argued that the phenomenon of small buildings on small parcels of land, be they very small, such as Tsukamoto and Kajima's examples of pet architecture, or simply small, as in the case of the typical pencil buildings, contributes substantially to the particular urban character of Tokyo. Indeed, arguments have been made that they even define the form of urban development in that city over time. To show this, one can cite the book Emerging Architectural Territories in East Asian Cities by Peter Rowe, <coughs> my former boss at Harvard. There, Rowe argues that during his time in office, Prime Minister Koizumi saw the highly differentiated pattern of ownership as an impediment to the, in his view, necessary modernization of Tokyo's business districts. As a consequence, Koizumi introduced policies at the political level of the national government to counter local municipal opposition and to encourage such massively large-scale redevelopments as Shio Dome, which you see here, uh, quite close to the harbor, <coughs> um, and, or, and then two more as drawn by um, uh, Peter Rowe's uh, graphics person. Uh, these two are uh, not too far apart. On the left in this image is Roppongi, and on the left, the one called Tokyo Midtown. As it happened, Shio Dome um, and Tokyo Midtown um, were built on parcels of, that were exceptionally large parcels that were already in unified ownership, some of them even public ownership. Uh, accordingly, it was not hard, difficult for the national government to facilitate their redevelopment. On the other hand, Rowe reports that the Mori Building Corporation had to deal with 600 different owners in order to assemble the land for its Roppongi Hills project. Okay, I have another one. Oh, yes, I do. Another Bakker photograph. <clears throat> and even then, the Mori Corporation had to agree to make some 400 of the total 600 property owners financial partners in the development project in order to secure their cooperation in making their land available for it. It is my sense that Tsukamoto and Kojima would see Roppongi Hills as problematically atypical for Tokyo and that they continue to be more interested in the ongoing contemporary evolution of the fine grain of micro-development that is more commonly typifies that city. Even Rem Koolhaas, the one-time advocate of bigness as the necessary defining feature of architecture in our era, has expressed criticism of the design of Roppongi Hills that is the most vituperative condemnation of a contemporary building that I have ever seen in print. In preparation for this presentation, I read a valuable recent publication by another of my University of Toronto colleagues, the geographer Andre Sorensen. Sorensen book, Sorensen's book is entitled The Making of Urban Japan. In a recent email exchange, he has enabled me to flesh out my understanding of the two Tokyo urban phenomena that so fascinate me, the highly differentiated pattern of ownership of urban land, and the emergence of the pencil building type. According to Sorensen, a complex series of historical factors is in play. <coughs> First of all, despite the fact that Tokyo is the largest city in the world, agricultural rural Japan still dominates Japanese national politics. And the national government until very recently, has until very recently, severely restricted the ability of local municipalities to control urban development. 
the national government's deference to Japanese farmers entails a very hands-off stance in regard to those farmers' desires to subdivide land that they control. And of course, the desire to subdivide is especially strong at the urban periphery of major cities. Since Tokyo has been the major locus of urban growth in Japan for over a century, this means that a largely unregulated pattern of land subdivision at the periphery has established the pattern of the city's growth uh, for a long period of time. And of course, even before that, according to Sorensen, the pre-modern pattern of urban land ownership in the historic cores of Japanese cities was already relatively fine-grained on account of the fact that pre-modern business enterprises were largely family-based and small in scale, and that urban land prices, even that far back historically, were relatively high. What is more, it is a common Japanese practice to subdivide family land for inheritance purposes, since, uh, especially since inheritance taxes are much lower on real estate than on other holdings. Accordingly, it is common as a means of passing on an estate to demolish a house and sever the land, allocating a piece to each heir. This phenomenon provides the backdrop for a praxis researched by Bow Wow, to which I will return later in this presentation. As if this were not enough, Sorensen goes on to report that, quote, the Japanese courts have, re have enforced a rather strict interpretation of the maximum area needed for any given project. Um, <clears throat> So throughout Japan, you find tiny bits and pieces of land that have been severed off or reduced to a size smaller than is conveniently buildable. Many remarkable structures have been built on these leftover bits, according to Sorensen, thereby providing a historical context for many of Bow Wow's examples of pet architecture. As for the pencil building, Sorensen reports as follows, I'm quoting from him again, there are no housing standards in Japan. Still, if I wish, I can rent out a 10 square meter windowless room with no running water as an apartment in Japan, as long as someone is willing to pay the rent. This, for a long time, greatly reduced homelessness as there were a lot of very small, inexpensive apartments available. The, quote, one-room mansion, end of quote, is a very popular rental product in Tokyo. Most do have toilets and sinks, though. This makes it possible to build a 10-story pencil building on a land parcel of 50 square meters and to create 20 apartment units, two per floor, plus elevator shaft and emergency stairs, end of quote. All in all, it seems to me that these various explanations help us to understand the distinctive pattern of urban form of Tokyo. I want to conclude this first part of my argument by returning to the phenomenon of the node, and the examples I want to use are Shibuya and Shinjuku. For, both of them, it's in, for in both of them, it seems to me, the typical Tokyo pattern reaches a kind of crescendo. In the first instance, one finds oneself in the central urban space of the node. Here we are. <clears throat> in the central urban space of the node, surrounded by large retail enterprises and the large-scale elevated urban infrastructures beneath and around which the intense urban life of Tokyo swirls. But walk just a few paces away from the center of the node and you will find yourself in a dense and intimate back street, sometimes full of small shops, restaurants, and clubs. This example is Shinjuku. And sometimes a suddenly quiet residential neighborhood um, uh, the example here is um, uh, Daikanyama um, behind the uh, Cerulean Hotel in, um, uh, Shin in Shibuya. This extraordinary and extraordinarily pleasurable urban scale shift is, in my experience, the essence of Tokyo's remarkable pattern of urban form. <clears throat> 
Okay, that's the end of part one. Now, now I, I plunge into dangerous territory. The most prominent, the prominent Japanese architect with whom I have most recently become acquainted is Fumihiko Maki. Since the death of Kenzo Tange, Maki can, I think, be seen to be the most senior member of the Japanese architectural elite. Um, curiously enough, I owe my introduction to him to the Canadian Ismaili community. As I expect many of you are aware, the Aga Khan has in recent years commissioned Maki to design two major projects in Canada. The delegation of the Ismaili Imamat in Ottawa, you're looking at it here, um, and the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, which you're seeing here. <clears throat> and in this connection, during my tenure as the Dean of the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture at the University of Toronto, the Amara Development Corporation set up to construct the Aga Khan Museum sponsored a lecture series at U of T in which Maki spoke. After his lecture, I offered to take him out to dinner, and notwithstanding the fact that he was quite jet-lagged, he's now 87 years old, he declined an interview with the architectural critic of the Globe and Mail newspaper um, <clears throat> in order to come to dinner with me. Um, only during the dinner did I come to understand his choice. In the 1950s, he had been a student during Jose Luis Sert's deanship at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Since he knew I had been a faculty member at the GSD more recently, he was eager to hear the latest Harvard gossip. It became clear to me both during his, that conversation and in later reading about Maki that Harvard had contributed significantly to his formation as a young architect. I, could even report, I can even report to you that, it be, that during our conversation we discovered that despite the fact that he had been there some four decades before I had, there was one faculty member with whom both he and I had been colleagues the distinguished historian Edward Seckler. Interestingly enough, it is the same Seckler who taught Mackey at Harvard in the 1950s, who also contributed the introduction to the 2008 publish, publication of Mackey's collected writings, Nurturing Dreams. In fact, this digression points to one of the most distinctive aspects of Maki's place in the roster of Japanese architects who have played major roles during the period from the end of the Second World War to the present. And that is that of all of them, he is the one who has spent the largest proportion of his career outside of Japan. <clears throat> and probably as a result has the most cosmopolitan outlook of them all, at least until the recent rise to fame of Kojima and Tsukamoto. Indeed, it is probably worth pointing out how historically fortuitous the timing of Maki's travels outside Japan turned out to be. He arrived in the US in, <clears throat> in 1952 to attend Saarinen's Cranbrook Academy of Art and then entered the Graduate School of Design at Harvard the following year. He managed to be present for the legendary first academic conference devoted to the emergence of urban design as a distinct design discipline in 1956 at Sertz Harvard. This, <clears throat> this was the event at which Jane Jacobs first gave expression to the criticism of modernist urban planning in America that would become the subject of her 1960 book, The, um, the Death and Life of Great American Cities. As if that were not enough, Maki also managed to attend the last meeting of SIAM in Otterloo in 1959. Then he became a junior faculty member at Washington University in St. Louis during its golden age when Joseph Passano was the dean and where he even managed to receive his first pro professional commission for a building, still there today. Uh, then, as if all that were not enough, he managed to get back to Tokyo in time to participate in the World Design Conference of 1960 uh, that was the launching platform for the Japanese movement known as the Metabolists. 
It is in an, in an examination of his role among his fellow metabolists that his distinctive cosmopolitanism comes most dramatically to light. As is well known, the metabolists, uh, com metabolists comprised a group of Japanese architects together with an industrial designer, a critic, and an architect turned government administrator. The architects were first and foremost Kenzo Tange, together with Kiyonori Kikutaki, Kisho Kurakawa, uh, and Fumi, Fumiko Maki. The industrial designer was Kenji Ekwan, um, the critic Noboru Kawazo, and the administrator Atsushi Shimakobe. Here they all are. This, this is not a great slide. It's taken from um, Cool Houses and Obris's Project Japan book. But it, I think it's a very telling image. It's basically showing all the metabolists except for Tange, who was already dead by the time this event took place. This is an 80th birthday party at which all of the uh, uh, metabolists uh, joined together. You can see in the yeah, well, there, there's Cool House's, in the upper right is Cool House's drawing of the seating arrangement around the table. At the 1960 conference in Tokyo, which was their launching pad for their movement out into the world, they presented a whole series of visionary proposals for new urban forms, which had some basis in the organic, I mean, they did call themselves the metabolists, um, and some in contemporary technological possibility. But perhaps most of all, in an effort to transcend architecture's traditional dependency on being constructed on the ground. Already on a brief engagement working as a visiting faculty member at MIT, Tange had developed with his students there <clears throat> an idea of a megastructure which could support housing up in the air over Boston Harbor. And here it is. Um, back in Tokyo, he developed even an even more ambitious version of this idea that would stretch across Tokyo Bay. This is a very famous image, I'm sure many of you know. <coughs> and later, uh, uh, Tange's metabolist colleagues Kikutake and Kurakawa would devise their own versions of the same idea. Interestingly enough, one can point to this particular interest of the metabolists as manifesting a similar frustration with the highly differentiated pattern of ownership of urban land as we have already associated with Prime Minister Koizumi four decades later. In Cool House and Obris Project Japan, it is even pointed out that Kikutaki came from an aristocratic family which lost its ancestral land holdings as a result of the land redistribution programs instituted during the American occupation after the end of, the wor of World War II. And there is an intimation that his participation in the metabolist effort to escape dependency on the ground plane is related back to this familial economic setback. But be the motivations whatever they were, there is no doubt that the various proposals for megastructures erected either above the existing city or over Tokyo Bay bespoke a heroic effort to escape gravity altogether. It may be an interesting sidelight to observe that I do not think Moisha Safdie's uh, uh, Habitat 67 at the Montreal Expo would, it, would have taken the form that it did had the metabolist structures not been so prominently featured in the world architectural press during the early 1960s. But it is not my purpose here to deliver an account of the history of metabolism. Instead, my purpose is to attempt to delineate a picture of the remarkable effort of the 20th century in Japan to determine what Japanness in architecture, to use Arata Isazaki's compelling method or terminology, might comprise. And I will address two aspects of the phenomenon of metabolism to assist me to do so. First is the manner in which it grew out of the particular circumstances of Japan at the end of World War II, and second in an account of the complex roles of Fumihiko Maki and Arata Isozaki in relation to metabolism, the former from inside the movement and the latter from outside it. <clears throat> 
But before even that, let me present a few speculations of my own on the remarkably distinct history of this offshore East Asian archipelago. As I am sure many of you are already aware, there has been a continuous lineage of emperors in Japan from the 7th or 8th century all the way to the present. But the emperors ceased to unilaterally rule Japan in 1192, when the first of a long line of shoguns, or military dictators, usurped first military and then political power relegating successive emperors during the period we now know as the shogunate to a secondary, more symbolic position of spiritual and cultural leadership. The shogunate lasted from the 12th century right up to 1867, when the last shogun ceded power back to the imperial family, um, in this case to the emperor Meiji. But most important for my purposes, in 1636, <clears throat> the shogunate enacted an act of seclusion, um, uh, to, which is to the best of my knowledge unique in world history, a regulation that forbade Japanese to travel abroad and uh, for foreigners to visit Japan. And this two-way prohibition, designed to minimize foreign influence on Japan, lasted for some two and a half centuries. It was, indeed, it was on account of his doubt that he would be able to succeed in continuing to keep foreigners out of Japan that the last shogun abdicated in favor of the Emperor Meiji in 1867. And it is during the so-called Meiji period, lasting from 1867 to 1945, that the modernization largely meaning industrialization and urbanization of a st still isolated, still feudal Japanese society took place in the short span of only 78 years. It is against this deep and dramatic historical backdrop that Isozaki will later attempt to articulate what Japanness in architecture might actually be. Then to continue this brief social and political history, I am sure also that most of you are aware of the apocalyptic nature of the defeat that Japan suffered in World War II. Not only did the United States drop the first two atomic bombs on major Japanese cities, uh, here we see um, Hiroshima, um, and, and uh, well, I'm not showing Nagasaki, but the second bombing, atomic bombing was Nagasaki. It also firebombed many other Japanese cities as well, as shown in this chart, um, uh, showing percentages of structures destroyed in various cities across Japan, also from Cool House and Obris Project uh, Japan. Um, you, you can see this, I mean, it's quite, these percentages are quite astonishing. It's like a, a majority of the structures in a majority of the Japanese cities uh, were destroyed in the war. Um, after the end of the war, downtown Tokyo, which was, didn't receive an atomic bomb, but which was firebombed, quote unquote, downtown Tokyo looked like that. In short, urban Japan was almost in almost complete tabula rasa. As part of the American occupation, a new constitution was written, and one of its results was a dramatic redistribution of agricultural land across the country, out of the hands of aristocratic landowners and into the hands of former small-scale tenant farmers. Remember the frustration of Kikutake about the seizure, seizure of his family lands already mentioned. But even the tabula rasa was not enough to erase the still extant, highly differentiated pattern of urban land on which the new Japanese cities would be rebuilt. And since successes of post-war national governments wanted to emphasize industrial recovery rather than urban planning, and since the local government's planning powers were severely circumscribed in any event, the gradual, if relatively rapid, rebuilding of the Japanese cities was a very haphazard undertaking. To be sure, urban infrastructure was rebuilt, the reindustrialization required that, and occasional episodes of more considered planning did take place. <coughs> the relatively quick post war construction of the Peace Memorial in uh, Hiroshima is a case in point. 
Uh, and it is indicative, it, that if we are to take Isazaki at his word, that the architect of the memorial was Kenzo Tange. For Isazaki, who worked with Tange for over a decade, has pointed out that Tange was al al already a significant, albeit young, practitioner before World War II and was responsible for designs for projects for the government of Japan during its occupation of Manchuria in the late 1930s as well as during the war. And not only that, the designs of the pro these projects were conceived in such a way as to conjure up Tange's ideas at that imperial time of what Japanness in architecture was supposed to be, even going so far as to model his proposals for a Greater East Asia Memorial Building, uh, Greater East Asia being the Japanese government's name for its uh, East Asian Empire in the process of being assembled during the war, <clears throat> which were modeled on the venerable Shinto shrines at Issei. Uh, so these are a couple of images from Isozaki's book of these uh, projects by Tange for the government uh, modeled on the shrines at Issei. Thus it was, according to Isazaki, that a particular aspect of historical architecture in Japan was invoked to represent the Japanese imperium by Tange. And in his remarkable book on so-called Japanness, <coughs> excuse me, Isazaki goes on to outline how after the war ended, Tange adroitly tacked left and right during successive social and political shifts in post-war Japanese history to project exactly the right kind of Japanness, um, or even to make Japanness more or less important uh, as required during his extraordinarily successful national and international career. His successful competition entry for the Hiroshima Memorial was only the first of many major post-war professional triumphs. And of course, his career was only a part of the dramatic economic boom that was sustained in Japan throughout the 1950s and 60s, ending only with the first international oil crisis in the early 1970s. So much then for the metabolists and their role in the evolution of architecture in the post-war period. Now I want to turn to the other aspect of this question, the curiously complex roles within it of Fumihiko Maki and Arata Isozaki. For as I've already pointed out, Maki is the one who spent so much time at the beginning of his career outside of Japan, while Isozaki, while indeed traveling abroad, stayed more or less at home. Yet it is Maki who became a member of the metabolist group, while Isazaki, despite his closeness to Tange, refused to do so. Uh, remember these images I've already shown you, um, which symbolizes um, Isazaki's uh, in distancing of himself from the kind of robust exuberance, exuberance of the metabolist project. As time went by, Isozaki's doubts about what he saw as the excessive utopianism of the metabolists turned him against them. Then too, in historical respect, er, retrospect, it is clear that while Maki did join the group, he was a rather dissident member of it, sharing, as far as I can tell, many of the same reservations as Isozaki. It seems evident that Maki did have a discernibly genuine metabolist streak in him that showed up in, in such projects as his Golgi structures concept of 1968. You see a model of it here. But even before that, he had already in 1964 published what is probably his most influential text, Investigations in Collective Form. This text combines Maki's experiences of historical European vernaculars with his wary, wary observations of modernist alternatives to it. It is in it that he first explicit, explicitly conceptualizes three distinct models of urban form, compositional form, megastructure, and group form. And they are uh, respectively summarized in these three uh, diagrams which he prepared. Compositional form on the left, megastructure in the middle, and group form on the right. 
And while Maki's text makes some arguments in defense of each of these conceptual models of urban form, <clears throat> there is no doubt that his own strongest interest is in group form as opposed to megastructure. And in his famous hillside terrace project in Western Tokyo, um, uh, the idea of group form is manifested very explicitly. Indeed, in his commentaries on Project Japan, Rem Koolhaas finds Hillside Terrace so contextual that he complains that it is even difficult to pick it out in an aerial photograph. So this is the, the aerial photograph included in Project Japan that enables to actually see Hill, Hillside Terrace as distinct from the rest of Daikanyama. And the whole of Maki's extensive subsequent career has been engaged in a variety of modes of finding modalities of group form that were appropriate to the many diverse commissions he received around the world. Hence it is that I say that notwithstanding his ongoing good relations with his colleagues in the metabolist group, Maki has from the beginning largely been a dissident from the main direction of the movement's ideas. As for Isazaki, having declined to join the group at all at the time it was first formed, he has since gone off on a different tack altogether. In his own architectural projects, he has shifted significantly away not only from the precepts of the metabolists, but away from many of those of modernism generally. And I have to confess that it is on account of this shift of his away from modernism, first toward European rationalism, and then to towards something approximating Anglo-American postmodernism that I became dismayed and eventually ceased to follow his career very closely. But this is where my colleague, U of T colleague Kasdan comes in, for it is he who argued to me that it was imperative to understand, in order to understand contemporary Japanese architecture that I read Isozaki's collection of essays entitled Japanness in Architecture. And it is as a result of my having done so that I now realize how seriously I have underestimated Isozaki's significance in contemporary thinking about Japanese architecture, for it is an astonishing collection. As with other topics on which I am touching in this commentary, I cannot do Japanness in architecture full justice here. <clears throat> but let me simply point to one major and very compelling theme developed by Isozaki in his various essays. For it is he who points out the, that the, the great significance of the fact that the canonizations of the two most famous two Japanese groups of historical buildings, the Katsura Imperial Villa in Kyoto, which we see here, and the inner and outer Shinto shrines in Issei, as definitive manifestations of Japanness, were in the first instance the work not of the Japanese themselves, but rather of an influential foreigner, Bruno Tout who visited both of them after his arrival in Japan in 1933. In his magisterial essay on Katsura, uh, Isozaki then goes on to point out that prior to Tout's writings about Katsura and Issei, both the villa and the shrines were known to the Japanese, obviously, but neither of them was seen to have been of any major significance in Japanese architectural history. He then proceeds to show how <coughs> excuse me, Kenzo Tange joined the bandwagon of foreign admiration, publishing, both books, uh, publishing books on both groups of buildings together with foreign authors and carefully editing the photographs, particularly of Katsura. These are uh, taken from uh, Isozaki, juxtapositions of Katsura as photographed in 1960 and below, um, as, as it really is, at least according to Isozaki, um, the suggestion being that it's trying to make um, Katsura look more uh, consistently modernist according to the principles that you might associate with 1952 projects by Mies van der Rohe. 
It is on this basis then that Ar Isozaki argues that over the period of time from Tange's publications of the, about these buildings up until the present, there has come to be accepted as historical fact a construction of Japanness in architecture that is entirely a modern ideological construction, and at that a construction devised in the first instance by a foreigner. And as if that were not astonishing enough, he goes on to point out how Tange subsequently would shift his position subtly back and forth between Katsura on the one hand and Issei on the other, uh, depending on which particular version of Japanness he was striving to project in his own contemporary projects of any given period between the end of World War II and the 1980s. This was to me an astonishing set of claims, and it is on account of it that I came to the conclusion that I had myself, as a student, been an unwitting victim of Tange's ideological project. Now, one might ask oneself, if one accepts Isozaki's spectacular historical deconstruction of the twin narratives of Katsura and Issei, where does this leave what we might call actual Japanness in architecture? Or indeed, can we ask if there really is any such thing? Needless to say, this is a very provocative important, and important question. In his brilliant historical analysis, Isozaki ruminates on what he thinks of as an enduring historical Japanese desire to formulate a persuasive myth of a beginning, especially in the case of the shrines at Issei. Sorry, I should keep going here. And he acknowledges the fact that throughout that long history, buildings in Japan have not had attributed to them the same cultural or religious importance as smaller scale artifacts have done. Notwithstanding the robust traditions of extraordinary craftsmanship that they embody. Here's an example from Issei, taken from Tange's book. And here's an example from Katsura in another photograph by Joost Bakker. It may in this sense be significant that the design of Katsura, as best can actually be determined, is not that of an architect, because at the time there was no such thing as an architect, but rather of a highly sophisticated master of the tea ceremony. Toward the end of his tour de force collection of essays, Isozaki offers up his own candidate for the position of originary exemplar of Japanness in architecture, though I suspect that he does so partly playfully. <coughs> but be that as, may, as it may, his candidate is the Nandaimon Gate at the Tojaiji Buddhist Temple in Nara. Here it is. Joost Bakker and Marley Ross and my wife and I went to Japan together, went to almost all of these places. We went by this, but I do not remember any of us seeing it. So, I feel, so me, Suzaki managed to make me look like a bit of a fool after I got home. For his purposes, for uh, Isozaki's purposes, it is suitably venerable, having been constructed in 1199. It is original in that unlike the Todaiji temple to which it is the gate, um, it has not been burned and reconstructed. It is tectonically rigorous, and perhaps most important for Isozaki, it has never been proposed as canonical by a foreigner. For my own part, I am inclined to set Isozaki's dazzlingly brilliant arguments in the context of the longer history of Japan that I outlined near the beginning of this section of my presentation. For it must surely be the case that the 250 year period of seclusion, during which, by the way, both Katsura and some versions of the Issei shrines were constructed, um, the Japanese must have lost some of the normal human capacity to imagine the other in human existence. And following the thinking of Hannah Arendt, a great intellectual influence on my own thinking, I would be inclined to, to speculate that not being able well to imagine the other increases the difficulty of knowing who one is oneself. <coughs> 
And remember too that that 250 years was followed by a mere three quarter century of process of accelerated modernization, which was then in its own turn followed by apocalyptic war damage and the reduction of much of urban Japan to a tabula rasa. I am inclined to conclude that it might be considered a miracle that the Japanese have figured out as well as they have done who they are and that this is an ongoing process, a most important phase of which may well be underway in our own time. Okay, that's the end of part two. Now we come to the last and final section. Up until, <clears throat> excuse me, up until recently, I used to say that Tsukamoto and Kojima were the only prominent Japanese architects who had an interest in the city, as opposed simply to the individual buildings that make up the city. But now that I have read Fumiko Maki's collection of essays, Nurturing Dreams, I have realized that I was wrong. For that collection not only includes the important and influential essay, Investigations, Investigations in Collective Form, that I've already discussed, and in which Maki sets out his basic urban ideas, it also includes a whole additional section of the collection of essays that is entitled On the City, and it includes his informative speculations entitled My City, The Acquisition of Mental Landscapes, and the Japanese city and inner space. The latter essay even includes his rudimentary analysis of the evolution of typical block structures over time in downtown, as we see here, and then again in uptown Tokyo. And since I have not been in com communication with Tsukamoto and Kojima, since I have been reading Maki, I do not know whether they acknowledge any influence from him. They do not reference him, so the matter is uncertain. But be that as it may, there is no doubt that the depth of urban analysis in which they have engaged goes considerably beyond what Maki has done in this area in any event. It is not insignificant that they have coined the term void metabolism to characterize their own theoretical approach to the analysis of the urban form of Tokyo, as well as to their own de design praxis building in it. <coughs> so it is at least evident that they see themselves working in a known lineage in, Jap in Japan, and that they are ready to oppose their urban ideas to those of their seniors and predecessors. For that matter, the whole last section of their major monograph, Behaviorology, is devoted to their urban analytical research, and when combined with their numerous other pu publications, it is a most impressive package of material. A few examples are as follows. These are typology studies of, uh, of uh, Bow Wow, uh, different sort of building forms, the low Makia, as they call it. This is the false mustache Makia. This is the mask Makia. This is retired but putting in a word Makia. This is Regent and Passage Garden Makia. This is the pencil building Makia. And this is the Makia mass built, mask building. And lastly, I think this is the last one, yes. The Sensei Doctor Lawyer Advocate Building. But I want to focus here, uh, I want here to focus in, in a, on a particularly informative essay written by Tsukamoto to accompany an exhibit of their work at the 2010. Venice Architecture Biennale. I have found it to be the most explicit explanation of what Bow Wow supposes it has been up to in both theory and practice. Interestingly enough, the essay is included in a small book entitled Tokyo Metabolizing. So we know right away that we are in the territory of polemics. The essay is called Escaping the Spiral of Intolerance, Fourth Generation Houses and Void Metabolism. As Tsukamoto puts it, now I'm quoting from him, 
The form of contemporary Tokyo is quite different from what was envisioned by the metabolist movement of the 1960s. The model that was advanced in the 60s presented a permanent core, he means here an architectural core, with variable capsules in a city that was constructed by a concentration of capital and authority. I really should have had an image here of um, Kurakawa's capsule building in Tokyo, which would explicitly represent this kind of characterization of of um, Tsukamoto's. However, in the metabolism with which we are presently concerned, due to the fact that each grain or house both constantly maintains and replaces a gap or void through the initiative of the individual owner, the capital and authority at work in the urban space is thoroughly dispersed, and Tokyo can be seen as an urban landscape of democracy. In addition, as almost no tax revenue is required to maintain this residential environment, it is a highly sustainable form. To differentiate this concept from the metabolism of the 1960s, we would like to refer to this phenomenon as a, quote, void metabolism, end of quote. In the later section of the same essay, Tsukamoto explains, now I'm quoting again, I'd like to examine the existence of multiple generations of houses in relation to the spatial problem of detached dwellings. And this is an example. The first generation, which is the far left, is represented by a single story house built within a, spatial, a spacious garden that is surrounded by a hedge on a lot of about 240 square meters. The second generation is exemplified by a two story structure on an approximately 120 meter square lot on part of which, due to the introduction of private cars, is allocated as a parking space. Despite this, some space has been being maintained for a small garden. The third generation sees further segmentation with a three-story structure occupying an 80 square meter lot. No longer able to maintain a garden, which is set back from the road, two-thirds of the first floor frontage in this generation of houses is taken up by a parking space. As each, a as each generation abuts the next in a haphazard manner, and the character of t the town is determined by the distribution of generations within the whole. On the other hand, by determining the distribution of generations, one can analogize the townscape. And these, this is a set of uh, you know, lot division diagrams with which they attempt to capture that analogization. Then moving from the morphological analysis to the evolution of the housing type, Tsukamoto goes on to state, again quoting, with the continuing land continuing rise in land prices came the aforementioned three generations of change in houses and residential districts which embody human living conditions. In the process, detached houses allowed the family to act freely as a basic unit of economic activity, programmed as an apparatus partitioned off from each other and isolated from the community. Both the family and the individual came to take on an increasingly fragmented role. This naturally exerted an influence on the form of houses, including the popularity of private rooms and other elements. Eventually, things reached the point where it was unnatural for anyone outside the family to be in the house, and the space became a purely domestic domain. The lack of invited guests led to closed houses, and coupled with the spread of air conditioning, exterior spaces around the house, such as the eaves and the garden, decreased significantly. Finally, he moves from, uh, he concludes by moving from critique to proposals. Isn't there a way of curtailing this interactive spiral of intolerance and creating tolerant spaces that are more conducive to living through the medium of housing? In an, order, in an attempt to achieve this, we have established three conditions that are necessary for fourth generation houses. One, bringing people from outside the family back inside the house. Two, increasing opportunities to dwell outside the house and three, redefining the gaps. And so I just quickly run through here. Um, uh, 
This, I'm, uh, the example I'm using here is um, uh, Tsukamoto and Kaijima's own house. This image is one in which you first see it from the primary street, but then you discover because it is on what they call a flagpole lot, a flagpole lot in Tokyo is a lot that has a thin strip with a narrow frontage at the street, which then goes in and then gets bigger at the back. Um, and their lot is like that. You actually have to go around the corner um, and go through a narrow passage between two neighboring houses, as you see here, to get to the, uh, the entrance to their house. And this is the cross section through it, in which you can see the, um, where the people who work in their, uh, the, the, the entrances to the left on the, the main floor level, the, the, the sort of half level below that is the workspace, for the, office, the, the people in the office. The half level above is the uh, meeting space for their practice and their desks for the two partners. And then you go up half levels above that uh, and the house becomes increasingly domestic um, as, you, as you rise up through it until you get to the top where um, the the garden which used to exist in the first genera generation house is now replaced by a roof deck as an alternative mode of outdoor space. Keeping in mind, by the way, that as I said at the very beginning of this talk, in Japanese residential neighborhoods, there is hardly any uh, um, private outdoor space at grade, just little thin strips of space in between the houses which are built autonomously from one another. Now this line of discussion leads quite logically to an exploration of that aspect of the practice of Bow Wow that comprises primarily the design of individual single family residences in and around Tokyo. Here is a series of them and in them you can see evidence of their efforts to establish the three conditions set out. I'm just quickly going to go through a set of them which are taken from behaviorology. But I, <clears throat> but I want to state also that while I have been familiar with both Bow Wow's research and with their ongoing professional architectural practice, I, I have to say that it has only been in the preparation of this presentation that I have come to fully grasp the significance of the relationship between the two. As you are, as you are probably aware, in addition to the houses, Tsukamoto and Kojima have also very successfully participated in a series of international art exhibitions in which their projects typically entail the public animation of activity <coughs> in some putatively or potentially public space. And these usually invention, in, entail the devising of apparatuses. Um, and you can see one of them here. It's a kind of sort of movable table. Um, here it is uh, having settled down in, on a lawn and being used as a, for dining. And then here, here is another one um, which um, is basically a kind of movable lounge also in public space. What I want to emphasize here is the fact that even in the designs of the houses their commitment to the public and to the common is palpably evident. Partly it has to do with the efforts made in their designs to quote, bring people from outside back in the house, end of quote. But it also has to do with their stance on the form of the relationship of the house to the city. That is to say, in the first instance, to the street. Uh, in, it is in this context that their critique of the designs of houses by Tadao Ando and others is so interesting. Again, to quote Tsukamoto, when I was a kid, Shigasaki, Shigasaki is a precinct of Tokyo, not a central one, but one which has become much more urbanized since uh, where, where, where he lived as a child. When I was a kid, Shigasaki st still had fields here and there between the houses, and children played in the open spaces that had not yet been turned into fields. The spaces between the houses were all interconnected, and although each family took care of their own area, there was a sense of openness and expansiveness uh, that made it possible for kids to play anywhere they wanted to. 
But the Chikasaki that I visited 20 years ago later seemed extremely stifling. The abundance of closed off houses was ruining the town. I thought it would be a shame to, contrib to, to contribute any further to this process, and on a personal level, I couldn't allow this to happen. At the same time, closed off houses have a more extreme form and are part of the lineage of Japanese residential architecture. One example of this is Tadao Ando's, oh sorry, I should have shown you that one already. One example of this is Tadao Ando's row house in Sumiyoshi. Uh, what, what, Tsukamoto asks, what would happen to the city if all of the buildings looked like that? So I think I can state that I now understand how the entire oeuvre of Bow Wow, from the individual houses to the designs for public space and public furniture, um, is an indissoluble spectrum of design principles. Moreover, I can now also confess that the startling diversity of the repertoire of formal moves that the various houses exhibit has been something of a mystery for me. I can state here that I am inclined now to see this diversity of moves not just in the context of Bow Wow's important urban research, but also even within the context and the long, of the long and difficult history of putative Japanness in architecture that I discussed in the previous section of this presentation. After all, we know that the historical Japanese construction of temples, gates, and houses whatever else one might want to say about it, uh, was always timber construction. Only the castles of the samurai in the medieval period got to be constructed of stone. Then too, we know that the Japanese archipelago is geographically especially susceptible to earthquakes. And earthquakes in urban areas typically result in serious fires. Even before the firebombing of World War, II, uh, World War II, the central area of Tokyo was already completely destroyed by the, the Kanto earthquake of 1923. This is a plan of Tokyo. You can see the harbor at the bottom. And of course, you know, in the middle of the kind of loop there is the Imperial uh, Palace. Um, but the, the sort of uh, pinky purple zone is what was completely burned. In, um, as, in, as a consequence of the earthquake in 1923. This is before we even get to the firebombing of two, World War II. And yet the pure type of the historical Japanese house relied entirely on the fact of its having been constructed of timber. Here is the plan as it shows up in one of Maki's essays. And here is a kind of typical historical street of the frontage of these houses, uh, which comes from Sorensen's book, but you can actually also recognize its roots in the typology that I just ran through from Bow Wow. <clears throat> Given the twin phenomena of rapid modernization between 1867 and 1945, and the resultant apocalypse of the Japanese defeat, I am inclined to think that the 1945 tabula rasa was not just a physical one. For it would seem that for all the many reasons I have just enumerated, the historical typologies of residential construction had by then come to seem to be utterly unrecoverable. In short, it would be necessary to invent the Japanese house all over again. I think that Bow Wow sees the four generations of vernacular Japanese housing as angst-ridden efforts, not just to densify and to privatize, but also to reinvent a believable residential typology. And if that is so, then Bow Wow's analyses and their projects can be seen as virtuoso performances in the quest for such a typology, one that restores the dignity of the dwelling and of the community at the same time. So this leaves me with a concluding question. Could it be that the sometimes deliriously variable iterations of house that typify the work of Bow Wow are their tacit contribution to the ongoing quest for, if not Japanness, after all, both they and Japanese society itself are now a little too cosmopolitan for that. But if not a quest for Japanness, 
then at least for some sort of distinguished local identity in architecture in Japan? This is the question I will leave you with tonight. I hope you have found at least some of these speculations of mine informative and provocative, and I hope that I have also left you thinking about Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.